when the rabbis sat down to make the calendar that would take us through the year, in particular the parashiyot, and the schedule of those parashiyot, they took into consideration the Jewish life cycle. And they understood that there were certain parashiyot that spoke to certain themes, and they tried as best as they could to align the themes of the parashiyot with the themes that were happening in the Jewish life cycle. And as such, they made sure that certain parashiyot immediately preceded or immediately followed certain times of the year. And to that effect, Parashat Devarim, which we just read, always immediately precedes Tisha B'Av. And it must be that the theme, or one of the themes of Sefer Devarim, highlights that which we commemorate on Tisha B'Av. And so I want to begin this morning by looking at Parashat Devarim and try and unpack how that might be connected to the Shabbat and what that tells me living today in the 21st century. Parashat Devarim, all of Sefer Devarim actually, is Moshe's last will and testament to the people that he led for 40 years. In fact, nowhere in the book do the words by Yaber Adonai and Moshe and Mor appear. It's the most frequent, the most common pasuk in all the Torah does not appear in Sefer Devarim because these are the words of Moshe Rabbeinu as he's leaving behind a legacy to the Jewish people. And he opens the book and the Pasuk says, These are the words that Moshe spoke to the entire Jewish people on the other side of the Jordan as they sat on the threshold of Eretz Israel. And then he goes on to enumerate places, stops along the way that the Jewish people had camped in in their 40 year journey in the desert, and then he gives them a crushing pasuk. I just want to point out, says Moshe. Here we are 40 years after Matan Torah. And I want you to know that it should have taken 11 days from Har Sinai to Eretz Yisrael should have been 11 days. But here we stand 40 years later and we still have not entered. And that's a problem. And Rashi, on the Pasuk, tries to explain what exactly Moshe Rabbeinu was trying to do in discussing the places that he enumerates in the Pasuk, most notably because of the fact that some of the places don't seem to exist. And so Rashi, on the first words of Sefer Devarim, writes, Elihad Devarim, Moshe Rabbeinu is criticizing, albeit very subtly, the Jewish people. You know why 11 days became 40 years? Because of all of the times that you complained in the Mikbar, and here is a list of some of those most difficult times. And he enumerates them. Ba'arava, what is Ba'arava? What happened Ba'arava, says Rashi? Ba'arvot Mu'av Bival Peor. Not very long ago, a few weeks ago, the Jewish people, after the story of Bilam and Balak, were seduced by the women of Mu'av. And they sinned. But Akadosh Baruch Hu has been showing you miracles for the last 38 years. How is it possible that you sinned, but you sinned? And that led to the 11 days that became 40 years. Mosuf, on the other side of the Yatsuf, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people, not only did it happen at the end of the journey, it happened at the beginning of the journey. 
right after we crossed the Yansu, and you just saw the miracles of miracles, you saw the plagues, you saw the Yansu, you saw what no other Jew in the rest of history will see. And what did you say? Habibli and Kibarim in Israel. You should have buried us in Egypt. You took us out into the desert. We're trapped between the Egyptian army and the Yamsuf. We're going to die. And they complain and they raise a hand to Kadosh Baruch Hu, and they raise a hand to Moshe Rabbein. And Moshe says, that was part of the complaint. That's why 11 days became 40 years. Ben Paran or Ben Tophil Bilavan. Again, more places that he lists that seem to highlight complaints of the Jewish people. But Ashi quotes a Gemara, Amar of Yohanan, says of Yohanan, Hazar al-Kol amikana v'lomatzinu makom sheshmo tofel v'laman. We look through the entire Torah, and these places don't seem to exist. And so what is Moshe referring to when he quotes v'laman v'chatzerot? And Ashi says he was reminding them of the time that they complained about the man the man was white, Lavan, and it was an insinuation of the color, and he was telling them that they complained about the man again. More complaints that made 11 days turn into 40 years. Vahatzerot. What is Hatzerot? Says Rashi. Korach. And Korach. Korach tried to impeach me. Korach tried to rebel against the Haron. And and that was another time that you complained that finally the Disa have, of course, most notably, the Jewish people sinned with the Egel HaZahar. So Moshe opens the book. He opens his last will and testament with two things. One, a crushing blow. Eleven days, and you could have had the dream. And 11 days became 40 years. And do you know why? Because you complained. And you rebelled. And you revolted. And because of that, the journey went on way too much longer than it should have. But the Bibashim asked a question on Moshe's words, primarily when looking at it through the eyes of Rashi. Moshe here is very subtle. He's alluding to their complaints by giving the places names. He's alluding to their complaints by saying things that would not have been otherwise understood unless somebody told us what they were. But later on in the book, in fact, not too many Pirakim into the book, Moshe Rabbeinu was going to criticize the Jewish people very openly and very transparently. So Moshe, why are you tiptoeing around it now? If you're going to come out and criticize them, come out and criticize them. It's going to happen anyway. He's going to complain. He's going to tell them about the man. He's going to tell them about the Egel Zahai. He's going to tell them about the Meravim. And he's not going to be apologetic about all the times that they complained in the Mibad that made 11 days, 40 years. So why does he begin with subtlety? Just come out and say it. We didn't do the right thing. We got it. Why is he beating around the bush? Why the tiptoe? And I want to begin to answer that question by reading a fascinating Gemara that I think will be comical at some point, but only comical because it's true. The Gemara is in Masechet Rachim Adaf Tetzayin on the bed, and it says, Minayim deroe v'chaverot davar b'gonesh ha'chayat ha'mochiko How do you know that if you see somebody doing something wrong, you have an obligation to criticize them. To rebuke them. Shenei Mar, because it says in the Pasuk, You have to rebuke your fellow human being if they're doing something wrong. How do I know if he doesn't accept the criticism, I have to criticize him again until he's willing to accept. Hamulomar, Tochiyach. You get it from the double Hashem. Ocheyach, tocheyach, rebuke him. And if he doesn't accept it, and he doesn't get it, rebuke him again until he gets on the right path. Yachol apil mishtarim panav. I might think that I could take this rebuke so far that I could embarrass him. It says again, Mara, you can't embarrass him. You have to find the right balance between rebuke and criticism and feedback. 
and retaining the dignity of another human being. How do I know that? Because the Basuk continues and says, Lord, he said, I can't be the one to cause a sin. I embarrassed him in public because I was trying to rebuke him. Well, one sin doesn't overweigh the other one, and that doesn't warrant rebuke. Now the interesting part. Give an accord to what I tell. And yeah, Amari Vitarfon, Timihani Ani, Im Yesh Bidor Hazesh Bikabel Tofacha, Im Amar Lo Tol Kesam Iven Shinecha, Amar Lo Tol Korab Iven Enecha, says in Vitarfon, but I wonder today if there's anybody who knows how to take criticism. You tell somebody you did something wrong, and he says, yeah, well, you did that wrong. You tell somebody, you well, know, you got something in your teeth. No, well, you got something on your nose. You tell somebody, you're not doing that right, and he tells you, well, you don't know how to do anything right. I wonder, says the Tanfon, if there's anybody who truly knows how to accept criticism in the right way. The Gemara continues, Amar Abi Al-Azhar, says to Abi Al-Azhar, Ben Azariah, Timihani im yesh bedor hazeh sheyodeya lehochiyach. Says to Abi Al-Azhar, Ben Azariah, I wonder if there's anybody who knows how to give criticism. Taking it is one thing, giving it is something else. How do I give criticism without deriding another human being? You're horrible. You don't know what you're doing. You're a terrible X, Y, Z. Is that how I give criticism? How do I give it in a way that is going to be accepted, and how do I accept it in a way that's going to be positive? And that begins to answer the question that we asked at the beginning. Why is Moshe open up Sefer Divani with subtlety about his criticism? Why is he dancing around it when we know he's going to be very transparent further on in the book? And the answer is as follows. The word for rebuke is tohacha, which sounds like the word hohacha. It has the same root word, and it means proof. You know how to give criticism in the right way? Say it in a way that allows the person to come to their own conclusions. Say it in a way where the person can realize on their own, I'm not doing the right thing. And so Moshe says, this is how it's going to start. I'm not going to wham you over the head with it. First, we're going to start with subtleties. And I want to see how far you come in realizing that this is the problem. So he says, we as a people have an issue. 11 days became 40 years. Anybody want to venture to guess as to why that happened? Let's talk about the journey. We complained about the man. We complained about the Egel. We complained about the water. We complained about the bed. I believe. Anybody getting this? Anybody want to volunteer any information as to why 11 days may have turned into 40 years? And he begins with subtlety in an attempt to give criticism in a way where people come to their own conclusion about what it is that they're doing wrong. And that, says Moshe, is the way we give it. Now, who in history mastered that concept? At what point in history do you remember of someone criticizing another human being through the venue of getting him or her to realize it on their own? It's in nothing. Shimoel Bet, somebody said it. Correct? Thank you, Marilyn. Happens to be a student of mine, but that's not mine. David HaMelech has just been involved with Bathsheba. David is a married man, he's the king, and he sees Bathsheba bathing on the roof of a building next to him, and he ends up sleeping with her, and she is married. And Natan, who was the Navi at the time, is sent by God to criticize. And you have to appreciate how the criticism is given. Natan pretends to be coming to David 
with a question on how to proceed in a certain judgment. He says, David, there are two men in this city X. One is very rich, and one is poverty stricken. There are Shidayat Sonuba, and the rich guy has all the wealth in the world, and cattle, and sheep, and houses, and real estate. He's got it all. Vilarash and Kol, the poor guy has nothing. Kim Kipsa Had Kitana Ashir Kana sold for one little sheep. That's his life. The sheep is like a is like a child to him. Raises him with his own kids. Mipitoto Khali feeds him every day, Mikosotishte gives him to drink with a kotishab, but he look him back, and the sheep is like a child. Even sleeps in his bed. And what happened? A guest came to visit the rich man. And the rich man didn't want to slaughter one of his own several cattle that he had for the poor person. And so he went and he stole the sheep of the poor man, the only sheep that he has, and he slaughtered him, slaughtered the sheep, to feed the guest. Davan, Matan is alluding to the situation with David. David, you have, you have several wives, and you have all the money in the world, and you're the king, and you have a castle. And yet, you were with Bathsheba. David's response, David is livid at this situation. David says, the rich man should be put to death. And he should pay back four times the amount of the sheep. Because of what he did, and he did not have mercy. Natan gives criticism in a way where he wants David to come to the realization on his own about the situation. David doesn't necessarily pick up on it till finally Natan says, This is you! But you can see the protocol, you can see the way Natan approaches it. I want to criticize somebody, I try to elicit the information. Let's talk about the situation. Let's try to figure out what the problem is here. And if a person gets there, they get there. If the person doesn't get there, then I move further along the path to get them to understand what the problem is, which is exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu was doing. And so even though he's going to be transparent about it very soon, the subtleties is the beginning of the process. And that's how he criticizes. How do I take criticism? Nobody wants to be told that they're doing something wrong, because everybody wants to be right. But interestingly enough, criticism is one of the key ingredients for success. There's a Mishnah Pekavot, the very end, that talks about the superiority of the Torah to anything else in life, and it says, Gidolah Torah yotem mina kahana mina keonah mina machut. Torah is greater than the priesthood and the kingdom. There are three things you have to have to be a king. There are 24 things that you need to have to be a Kohen. The Torah can only be acquired with 48 attributes. The Elohim of these are them, and it lists it, and one of them is You love criticism. I would ask you to raise your hand, but I would take the liberty of assuming it would be nobody. How many people like to be criticized? And I would imagine it's no one. Because again, nobody likes to be told that they're doing something wrong. But consider the words of Shalomu HaMele, and then we can discuss. Shalomu HaMele, in Sefer Kohelet writes, Shalom Ahmedah says there are going to be two categories of people in your life. There's going to be the yes men, 
and there's going to be the people who challenge you. And everybody likes the yes men. Because I like to be told that I'm great. Rabbi, great speech. I love those people. It's the people who told me I wasn't following, it wasn't good, it was off track. It's those people that you don't like to hear from. But it's those people who will make me better. And so Shalom Abed says, you know what we say about the yes men? They're like trying to light a fire with live wood. You know what happens when you try to light a fire with live wood? It crackles and it makes a lot of noise, but the fire never gets going. The people who yes you in your life, they're making a lot of noise. But they're not getting anywhere. Ga'arat Chachamim, it's the people who have the goal and the audacity and the courage to look you in the face and say, hey, that was cool. Hey, you're doing this wrong. Hey, why don't we consider doing this another way? Those people are instrumental to success. And I want to illustrate with a silly example, but I think it's very palpable. You just had Oreo cookies. You love them. Especially now. And after you have Oreo cookies, you pop two front teeth full of chocolate. Can't help it. And now you're walking around all day talking to people smiling, and there's chocolate on your front two teeth. And you confront the person with the chocolate on their teeth, and now it's very awkward. I don't really want to tell him, it's embarrassing, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable. But if I don't tell him, he walks around the rest of the day with chocolate on his teeth. How many people in the room, and now I will ask you to raise your hand, would rather have the person tell you that you have chocolate on your teeth? Okay, I think we're at 100%. That's a silly example. But all of the other examples, difficult as they may be to navigate, have the same effect. It wasn't a good speech, Rabbi. It's not comfortable to hear. But if I want to be better, i got to man up. i got to take the criticism. As Shalom Ahmedah says, better to be on the receiving end of that than the people who brush you off and say you're doing everything perfectly. By the same token, somebody gave me this example this morning. You're talking to somebody, and he tells you that he's going to be driving to Florida. He's talking about the trip, he's talking about the journey, and he says, yeah, I'm about to get on to 95 North. Ninety-five north, you're going to end up in Canada. Now, if I care about that person, I would probably tell them you should switch around and go ninety-five south. But what happens when I don't give you criticism? You end up totally in the wrong direction. And if I think about it like that, perhaps the next time I want to give somebody criticism, I might actually dig up the courage to do so. Because letting it slide allows you to avoid the temporary pain of an uncomfortable situation. But then I have to bear the permanent pain of watching that person do the wrong thing because I didn't tell them something. But here's the real truth. And here's the hardest part about it. And here's the reason why you don't like to give, and you don't like to get criticism. Because when I criticize somebody, I put my own vulnerabilities on the table. Because if I tell Ralph that he's doing X, Y, and Z wrong, the first thing he's going to think is, well, who are you to tell me that? You do A, B, and C wrong. And I leave myself open for reciprocal criticism. And that we can handle. But when that happens, I ask you to go back to the case we had before. If there was chocolate in your teeth, would you want somebody to tell you or not? And if the answer is no, have fun the rest of the day. 
But if the answer is yes, then putting your vulnerabilities on the table might be temporarily painful, but in the long run, that's where you find success. Because criticism is an ingredient in making that happen. And so Shalom Bahamelech in Sefer Mishneh writes, Al tochach letz ten isnaeka ocheach mechacham ve'yehabeka. When you rebuke and criticize a fool, he hates you for it. When you rebuke and criticize an intelligent person, he loves you for it. And that's all the difference in the world. But you're going to ask, it's Shabbat. Why are we talking about criticism? What does this have anything to do with the destruction of the Bethany Dash? Because if I took a poll and I asked you to raise your hand and tell me why the Bethany Dash was destroyed, and I was in particular talking about the second Bethany Dash, you would tell me because of Sinat Hina. But the truth of the matter is the Gemara offers a myriad of reasons as to the destruction of the second Bethany Dash, one of which is the following, and it's recorded in my second Shabbat. Amar Amram, Kred de Shimon, Baraba, Amar de Shimon, Baraba, Amar de Hanina. Lo Hareva Yerushalayim, Ela Bishvil Shelo Hohihu Ze et Ze. You know why the Bet Hamidash was destroyed? Because nobody was willing to criticize their fellow human being. And he quotes a Pasuk in Echa, Shene Emar. The Pasuk says, and their princes were like rams, walking around aimlessly, describing the leaders of the time of the Jewish people in the destruction of Bethany Dash. Says the Gemara, and excuse the language, when rams walk in a single line, the head of one ram is pointed in the direction of the backside of the other. That was the Jewish people, the Tanah Seg Ben-Amikdash. Everybody put their head down and went their own way. And the guy next to me is lying, cheating, and stealing, and nobody said a word. And the woman across the street is doing all kinds of terrible things, and nobody said a word. Where is the communal responsibility? Where is the responsibility to make sure that the people who are surrounding you are also doing the right thing? And so people walk around and nobody care. And so you might ask me and say, but one second, that is completely antithetical to the Sinat Hinam reason. Sinat Hinam means baseless hatred. You want to tell me you want people to rebuke each other? That's only going to make the hatred worse. There's nothing that's going to fuel hatred more than looking at another person in the eyes and saying, Hey, you're wrong. But that is, in fact, not correct. You know, last night, the shul that I was in, one of the rabbis gave a class on baseless hatred. See, not hang on. And he talked about the causes of it. And he talked about where it came from, and he talked about that in relation to the destruction of Beth Amikdash. And somebody in the audience raised his hand. He says, Rabbi, that's very nice. But we do this every year. Every year you tell us that the reason for the destruction of Beth Amikdash was Sinan Tinam, and we have to change it, and we have to make Ahabat Tinam. That's great. But nobody told us how. It's very nice to say you want me to love everybody, but that's simply just not going to happen. Maybe outwardly I'll love you, but inward, I'm harboring ill will. How do I let go? And the answer is the Pasuk. You are not allowed to hate another person in your heart. You have to rebuke him in the right way. How do I get past baseless I'll tell you. Have 
the honest, transparent, uncomfortable situation that clears the air. Air out the dirty laundry. You and I don't see eye to eye. Guess what? It's bound to happen. But if you go your way with your perspective, and I go my way with my perspective, the only thing is going to breed is hate. But if we sit down and we have an honest conversation, and by the way, honest conversation doesn't mean we have to walk off the table and all be in agreement. We can agree to disagree. But what it does mean is, you allow me to criticize you, and I allow you to criticize me, and we take the criticism for what it's worth, and we make the appropriate changes, and then we get off the table with a common understanding of why we don't see eye to eye, and then we can have respect. But the problem is nobody wants to have the uncomfortable conversations because I'd rather avoid that temporary shifting and moving in my seat than fix the problem. But I would venture to guess that if you had someone in your business who was not doing their job, who was stealing, let's say, difficult as the conversation might be to have with them to fire them, the other choice is avoid the conversation, everything's happy-go-lucky, everybody go their way, but you continue to be stolen from. So what's it going to be? You want to step up and have the uncomfortable conversations and criticize and be transparent and be open, or do you want to let this cycle continue? Those are the choices. Most people are not going to choose to have the uncomfortable situation, the uncomfortable conversation. But I would also venture to guess, even though you won't admit it, even though you won't admit it, most people prefer the truth. Because I'd rather you tell me, it's like my wife tells me all the time, if I'm making something that you're not going to eat and you don't like it, tell me. Because otherwise, I'm going to keep making it and you're going to keep not eating it and we're going to continue to fight about it. So I'd rather you tell me the truth, even though it hurts now, so we can move past it. But most people don't want to have that conversation. But most people also want the truth. And I want you to ask yourself whether or not you would rather be told honestly, respectfully, what it is you're doing wrong so you can fix it. Or have somebody pretend that all is fine. And I'm going to let you think about that. Because sometimes the answers bounce back and forth. Which leads to the next point. Which is Gemara Masechet Sanhedrin. The Gemara questions the contradiction that seems to appear between two Bizuki. One Pazuk says, Ish behet, oh, you mad. Everybody is responsible for himself, everybody dies, or everybody's punished for their own sins. The next Pazuk says, The Kashidu Ish we fall because of the sins of our brothers. Well, which one is it? Am I responsible for myself or am I responsible for everybody else? And the Gemara goes through a discussion and it harmonizes the Pazukim, and the bottom line is, we are responsible for each other. If you're doing something wrong, and I have the ability to fix it, and I don't, I am also guilty. If someone is stealing from your business, and you can stop it, and you don't, and then the boss finds out, are you or are you not just as guilty for the theft that happened? The Gemara wants to say, you are. You are in fact guilty. And everybody would prefer the truth. And so here's where this connects. Moshe Rabbeinu is opening up Sefer Divan. 
It's his last will and testament to the people that he led for 40 years. And the rabbis were conscious to put it right before Shabbat. Because the message is very clear. Moshe Rabbeinu looks at the people and he says, I am going to tell you what is going to be the single biggest problem that will plague the Jewish people for the next few thousand years that will be the cause of all destruction and all the problems and all the issues that we have, and that is Sinat Hinam. You're going to hate each other, you're going to curse each other behind closed doors, there are going to be factions more so than any other religion in the world, and that is going to tear us down. Let me tell you now how to stop the problem. Be honest with each other. Be truthful. Have the goal have the audacity, have the courage to look out for the person sitting next to you. And if it means telling them that they have chocolate in their teeth, no matter how uncomfortable that might be, have the conversation. Because if you don't, you are feeding a downward spiral that will take you down also. Because if the person sitting next to me is on the wrong path, eventually, I will be on the wrong path as well because we're all in it together. And so if you want to fix the problem, you fix the problem one at a time. Have the honest conversation. Now there's a disclaimer to that. I'm not asking you to go out there and fix the whole everyone's going to go. Rabbi Tobias told me I should just open up the criticism box and everybody's on a war path tomorrow. That's not where this is going. Start small. Start with the people in your immediate family. How many times? How many times a fight occurs between spouses? Because I was uncomfortable in saying what I really wanted to say, so I held on to it. And then three weeks later, some silly thing happens, and the whole world is coming to an end. So I think my wife might be here, and I might get read night with all this criticism and all, but have the conversation. Have the conversation. Because if we want things to change, we have to change them. What makes us think that just because we want Sinat Hinan to go away, it's going to go away? It doesn't happen like that. The world doesn't change. Because we want it to change, because I wished upon a star, or because I thought the way it should be is that way. It doesn't happen that way. We have to be active participants in making it change. Here's something to work on. Open up the conversation. Sit at the table. Let's talk about it. This is the problem I have. This is where I think you're going wrong. This is what I think you need to change. This makes me uncomfortable. And hash it out. Bring the person to the point where they realize on their own where the problem is. And if they don't, then be more transparent. So on the criticizer's end, I do it in a way that's as comfortable as possible. And on the criticizee's end, I appreciate where it's coming from. It's coming from the fact that you care about me. Because if someone in your family was addicted to something, I have to imagine you would say something because I care about that person and I don't want the addiction to take over their life. Or a shying away from that conversation because it's an uncomfortable conversation to have. Well, if you care about the person enough to tell them that they're addicted to something and it hasn't changed, why should that be any different than anybody else? That's the problem. The problem is... We don't care enough. I don't care enough. I'm like a red walking in a straight line. I got my head down. These are my problems. These are my issues. You do your thing. I do my thing. And we go our separate ways. Wrong. That's how Sinat Hinam is bred. And so as you walk it out today, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you that next time you see something happening that doesn't make sense. Next time 
your wife or your husband is doing something that was uncomfortable or hurtful or not right. I want you to think about whether or not harboring that to avoid the uncomfortable conversation is really getting you anywhere. And I want you to think about whether or not if you had chocolate in your teeth, you want somebody to tell you. And I want you to think about the guy traveling 95 north on his way to Florida. That's what I want you to think and I want you to understand that Sinat Kinam has a solution. It's uncomfortable. It's difficult. It doesn't feel right. But there is a solution. That was the words of Moshe Rabbein on the opening of Sefer Devarim. This is going to happen. Sinat Kinam is going to happen. But we have to fix it. We have to fix it by criticizing, we have to fix it by being giving feedback, difficult as that may be. Because if I care about you, because if I want you to see success, I'm willing to rip off the band-aid. And it'll scream, and it'll hurt, but it will also heal. And in that merit, Bezat Hashem, we can turn the tide. It makes Sinat Hinam a Havat Hinam, so that those conversations can be very, very different. Once that happens, this school is going to come out.